Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics podcast. Today, we have a very illustrious guest, Jason L. Jason served as a Marine for 12 years. After that, he joined the nuclear security industry. And from there on out, he was recruited by the CIA. And he has a different role right now in the IC. Welcome. Hey, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Jason, I, I quickly went through your bio. Could you please start from the start and tell us a little bit about yourself? Born and raised in New Jersey, in the U.S. Always wanted to be a Marine. So when I turned 18, I joined, left for boot camp. After my training, I was an infantryman and uh, did a couple deployments with 3rd Battalion, 6th Marines, was in Mogadishu during the end of the U.S. time in, in uh, Somalia. After that, came back to the U.S. thinking that I was done for a little bit and immediately went into uh, Haiti for a little while, was redeployed there, and then went to various places in the Adriatic, former Yugoslavia, places like that. After I left the Marine Corps, I was medically retired after 12 years, worked in the nuclear security industry on a response team. And after that, I did while I was doing that, I was going to college. And while I was in college, I had a cousin of mine reach out and said, hey, what are you doing? You know, career wise, told him what I was doing. He had me send him my resume, send it to him. He comes back and says, okay, you're going to get a phone call. So get a phone call. It was very cryptic phone call. Didn't quite understand what was, you know, what was happening. And it was uh, long story short, it was a, a CIA recruiter. And uh, they said they were interested. So they kept up with my, my academic career as well as my professional career and uh, to make sure that I was still somebody that they would want. And literally the process from the time that they called me and I applied to the time that I onboarded with my training class, it was three years because I was doing things that required them to have to keep restarting my security background. Because every time you leave the country, they can't do it while you're overseas. They're not going to do it while you're overseas. So they have to wait till you're back in the States so they can do interviews, things like that. So finally, I was done going overseas with this company I was working with. And in March of 2008, I onboarded and started my training and, you know, did 10 years there. And then I left there with the intentions of not coming back into the federal government. I worked privately for about a year and then went back into you know, federal government, and now I'm a recruiter for the intelligence community. Super interesting. Thank you for that. I mean, I, I never knew that they had to restart your, your, your background checks while you go abroad and probably why it, it takes, it takes so long to get a clearance anyway. Eh, I, I don't know exactly what it is now, but normally it's about just a few months from the time that you apply to the time that they say, Hey, we want you to come on board. Usually it's about at the six months, but again, just going to stop your security background check and uh, keep it on hold until you get back. And then they'll li they literally ask me, listen, man, do you plan on going overseas anymore? Because, you know, we keep starting and stopping this thing. And I said, no, I'm done. So that's when they were able to finish it. And you were going overseas for work or? I left the nuclear security and I started working for. A guy that I met at a security conference, he owned a mobile training team, special operations teams. So he said, hey, I'd like you to come on board as one of my instructors. So I got trained up in his certification programs. I had to go through firearms courses and tactics courses, things like that. Once I did that and I had my train the trainer training done, um, then I started working with him as a instructor. So we were doing, we were training teams here in the United States, but then he got a contract over in Taiwan to help train their, some of their SWAT teams. So fortunate enough to go over, do some work over there for a couple months. That's so interesting. I mean, I, I, I would expect you to have written a book by now from all your experiences. <laughs> yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I, I don't think I can compete with the SEALs out there. I don't think it would sell. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Where did you grow up? In uh, New Jersey, right on the beach. Uh, it's funny though. I don't surf or anything, but uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't surf or anything. But I grew up fishing and you know being at the beach and uh, when I wasn't working as a kid. So that's where I grew up. I mean, it's it's very common in the U.S. 
that you joined the military because you come from a military family? Did your I, father serve I don't, for you? No, my grandfather, on my father's side, my grandfather served in the army in World War II. He was in, he went into Saipan and Okinawa um, during the last year or uh, months of the war. And um, of course, back then we know that African-Americans were relegated to support roles. So he didn't see combat that I know of. Um, I know he was in a uh, support unit. And so that was it. My father never served. No one else. I was the only one. But I wanted to do it since I was like six years old. I wanted to be a Marine. Saw the uniforms and I said, you know, I, that's what I want to do. I think you kind of answered the question, what inspired you to Yeah, to become a it was when I was a kid and, and all, it just more and more fascinated me. So I decided that was what I wanted to do. Did the experience match what you had envisioned? You know, you hear the term, there's an ethos around the Marine Corps and it's kind of like this myth, this legend and, you know, invincible first in last out, that kind of stuff. And, uh, I have to say that. They do a good job in boot camp of instilling that in you, that you're, you know, hey, you're part of the best, the most elite fighting force um, on earth, you know, that sort of thing. And you really come out of boot camp in, with that in your head. You know, some, for the worse, you know, they go home and end up trying to take on the entire world, you know, because they think they could fight everybody. But overall, it's more a sense of pride and discipline that they instill in you that has carried over, um, at least everybody, most Marines that I know after they're out, there is at least one thing that the Marine Corps instilled in them that they still carry. And with me, it's, that's definitely uh, a big thing. I know. I mean, maybe it's a bit of a cheesy question, but what is your most memorable time as a Marine? As a Marine? Um, and this is kind of a personal thing, like a family thing. So when you're in boot camp in training, the last week of your training, unless it's changed now, I think it's the day before. Yeah, the day before you graduate, your family is able to come and you can show them around the base and where I train, that sort of thing. And so my daughter, my oldest daughter, when I left for, for training, she was five months old or so. And uh, when I first saw when I saw them for the first time after 13 weeks of training, my mom had my daughter in her arms and she put her down and I was like, she's going to fall, you know, because when I saw her, she was only crawling and she's like, no, watch. And she walked to me and, you know, me grown man is like ready to cry. So, uh, you know, seeing my daughter walk for the first time, that was a huge one. And then honestly, my time in Somalia had a huge impact on me. The people there that I met were just incredible despite their situation that was going on at the time very friendly. I have a lot of um, trinkets that I bought home with me that were given to me, things like that. And uh, so that had a big impact on me as well. That was interesting. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, I was born in Somalia. Yeah. I, I yeah. didn't, I didn't grow up there, but I went back there to work, but <clears throat> it is very interesting that you, that you say that because yeah. I think obviously Somalis are portrayed in a certain way in the media yes. and, uh, yep. if it's not pirates, it's hunger. If it's not hunger, it's terrorism. You know, it gets a bad rap. It, it it's correct. Doesn't deserve it. But what people say is correct. I think there is, it's skewed, but it's interesting to hear your, your experiences. I mean, was that after Black Hawk Down? It was, it was actually right after. So that. The Black Hawk Down incident was uh, October of 1993, and my unit was there in mm -hmm. January of uh, 1994. So just a few months after. Mm. And how did that impact you? When we first got there, it was kind of, I guess, sort of tense because we we were told before we got there, hey, you know, the whole purpose of us being there is to secure passage for to start pulling out u.s troops you know u.n and u.s troops um so it was a little bit tense knowing what had happened before and uh you know we were able to some of us on during patrols or um you know runs to the port 
things like that. Cause I was, my unit was at the airport at Mogadishu airport. And so when we go to the port mm-hmm. or do patrols, you know, mounted patrols and stuff, we were able to see some of the areas where the battles took place. And, um, it was pretty sobering knowing that at any second it could be us, you know, it didn't, it didn't end up that way. And I'm a huge history buff. So just being able to see those things, um, mm-hmm. fascinated me. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, also, uh, I think I was six or seven years old. So, uh, yeah. I, I remember it. I think I haven't seen or read anything on Black Hawk Down since maybe this year. Mm. Cause I didn't want to. Yeah. You uh, didn't want, I remember it, it, you know, especially when, when in the aftermath with the American soldiers bodies were were like displayed and, and dragged. I remember that my mother next to me cried and said, this is it. We don't have a country mm. anymore. And that, that, that impacted me so that I never really wanted to read about it or want to see it. It's a memory that, yeah, it's, it, it was like, I think the first time at the time we were in the Netherlands, then my mom realized we are not going to go back at least not anytime yeah. soon. Cause that's what they believed in the beginning when, when we left the country. So that's very interesting to see that from your perspective. And I think it's, uh, I mean, the, the listeners cannot see us, but we are two, yeah. both two black guys. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's a different experience. I think, uh, from that perspective. All right. And you were medically retired. How, how, how did that go? Uh, so in 2001. February, 2001, I woke up one day, I was stationed in, uh, at Marine Corps air station, Iwakuni, Japan. And it was a three-year tour with my family and woke up one, it was a s- Monday morning thinking that I had the flu, you know, a little achy, whatever. And within a few hours, it got to the point where I was completely paralyzed on one side of my body. I j- was like, could have, it was having trouble seeing out of one eye all kinds of stuff. It was just weird. And I was throwing up everywhere. And so my ex-wife called an ambulance. She called the clinic. There was no hospital at the time. It was just a clinic. And uh, so they sent an ambulance. I don't remember anything past the, the paramedics getting there. She filled in a lot of it and the doctors filled in a lot of it. So apparently I picked up some kind of virus from a friend of mine, his daughter. They went to Thailand to visit her, his wife's family. The daughter got sick while they were there. I picked them up from the airport. And then the next day, which is that Saturday, I took her to the clinic because she was sick. He was working. So he asked me to take her. So sometime in there, I picked up whatever she had. This is what they believe. They're not sure. Picked up whatever she had. And then next thing I know, I was literally dying. My heart stopped at the hospital because they sent me out in town to a Japanese hospital. So my heart stopped twice. They got it restarted. My brain had started swelling. Uh, my temperature got up to, from what I was told, the highest got up to was almost 106 degrees, all kinds of things. So based, so at the time that one of the doctors, the ER doctors told my, my ex-wife that, uh, we don't know if there's anything we can do to save them because they were trying everything to try to figure out, you know, how to, what was wrong with me. This is Feb, that's February, 2000 by October, November of 2001, they still had not figured out what was wrong. And I was in every hospital. I had been in every hospital that the U S military had in the Pacific from Okinawa to Atsugi, Japan to Guam, Hawaii, all over the place. And then finally the commandant of the Marine Corps got involved apparently and his office and said, either you figure out what's wrong with this guy or you're going to have to retire him medically. So they sent me to the hospital in San Diego. It's called Balboa Naval hospital. And uh, I remember that a doctor there, he was a neurologist saying to me, listen, I'm one of the best at what I do. He was a Navy doctor. If I can't figure out what's wrong with you, nobody can. So that was in probably about 2001. By September of 2001, he literally said, I can't figure out what's wrong with you. So I guess I broke his winning streak. So they put me on a plane, (laughs) sent me up to Travis Air Force Base in California. And I was in a hospital bed. I had had a seizure on September 10th. 2001, September 11th, 2001, a nurse wakes me up. She's like, your wife's on the phone. I, you know, I get on the phone, she's crying. And I'm like, what is going on? Cause my family was still in Japan. 
at this time. They're still stuck in Japan. So I wake up and I, or I get on the phone with her. I'm like, what's wrong? You know? And she's like, you don't know. And I'm like, no, what, what's going on? Well, then I realize there's all this activity going on at the base. Like you can hear planes taking off all kinds of stuff. Just, it was just nuts. So she's like, Jason, we're under attack. And I'm like, my first thought is the base in Japan is under attack. So I'm freaking out. So she's like, no, no, no. A plane hit a tower in New York City, and they think we're under a terrorist attack. So I immediately turn on the TV, and as I'm talking to her, second plane hits the, the tower number two. And so I'm like, I'm coming back to Japan. Get off the phone with her. I call my command. They're like, you're not coming back to Japan. No, We're not flying any non-essentials. You're not going. So I'm arguing. Finally, I said, okay, fine. Get my family to me. So I didn't see them until... I, the last time I saw them was they came to California in, I think it was June, about June or July of 2001. I didn't see them again until November of 2001 when they could finally get a flight out. So the Marine Corps wow. sent me back to the East Coast to a, a reserve base, joint reserve base in Pennsylvania, and basically did a little impromptu, you know, Hail Mary, you're retired now thing. And that was it. I was out. So now I'm just raided by the veterans affairs i get a pension and you know yeah that was it never figured out what was wrong with me there, you never found out no no a virus of unknown origin um they could see something was there even this the center for, for disease control got involved and the lasting effects of it are my blood pressure is sky high that's even you know i'm in pretty good shape it, it won't come back down without medication i get severe severe migraines which i never had before things like that. So, and there are people, it's funny. I met someone probably in 2006 at a uh, Marine Corps gathering and he knew exactly who I was. Just as soon as I started telling the story, he knew exactly because everybody in, in the Pacific knew because they were afraid that what I had was going to spread whatever it was. So yeah. So I was infamous, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it, it sounds absolutely crazy. I mean, yeah. and, and not knowing what it was, I think that's, that's so scary, but props yeah, to you for, I mean, you died three times pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was uh crazy. Thank God. I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so then you were retired. You went back to school. I did. Well, that? first I, oh, um, you, you went to nuclear security first. Yeah. So I, for a little while, I couldn't do anything because I was just so like ba bad off from my, from the sickness. So I couldn't do anything for probably about six months or so. So just got my family settled back in the U S back in the East coast and doing unarmed security for a friend of mine just to make a little extra money. And as I was doing that, someone mentioned a guy that i was talking to mentioned hey you know the nuke power plant i think they need people on their security team so i applied and at the time they were only they were just at the tail end of only hiring ex-military or law enforcement because it was after 9 11 you know this was well after 9 11 so they're they were just on the tail end of that so I was hired. I finished their training because you have to go through, not only do you go through weapons and security training, but you have to go through what they call rad worker, which is radiation worker, like, cause you're working in a nuclear facility. So, you know, you have to wear like a dosimeter, you have to wear, you know, all this other stuff. And, um, like you're literally part of your patrol and your training. You're literally at some point sitting right next to the reactor, like literally inside the building right here, you know, right next to your left shoulder or right shoulder or whatever. So you have to know how to conduct yourself around it. And if there's an emergency, what you have to do, stuff like that. So completed that training. And while I was doing that, while I was working there, I was going to college. Um, I had started while I was in the Marine Corps, figured, okay, might as well take this opportunity. It's free. So was uh, finishing up with college. And yeah, that's when the whole agency, you know, CIA thing happened. What were you studying? Uh, so I have two degrees, one in history and the other in political science with a minor in uh, public policy. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, you said you were a history buff, so it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. So you, you get recruited, you train, mm -hmm. and 
then you join. Yep. Now what next? As much as you can say. So you join or yep. what happened after? That too, uh, but also after. Okay. So there's different ways that you can be, uh, you can join. So I was recruited. I was approached to join. Why to this day? I still, still don't know. I don't know because the, the CIA and the intelligence community was nowhere near on, was nowhere on my radar as a career perspective. Mm. I just didn't believe that I had what it took. Like, you know, you read the books, you see the movies, you know, about none of which are accurate, but you, you see these things and you're like, there's no way I'm not Jason Bourne. I'm not, you know, I, I, I can't do these sorts of things. You know, I'm not what they're looking for. And you yeah. find out quickly that none of that is what they're looking for. So apparently I had the background between the military and my academic studies and having been overseas, cause that's a big uh, plus for them, if you have overseas experience. Um, and I also think at the time that they wanted to bolster their roster as far as minorities were concerned. So not that they wouldn't look my way if I wasn't African-American. I'm not saying that they would or wouldn't. I'm just saying that I think that had a part to play in it too, which is fine because, you know, obviously if we need that, that's what we need. So they asked me to, I yeah, said, Hey, if you're, you know, if this is what you'd like to do, you know, we'd like you to do it, go on the website. You have to, now you, ha I don't think you had to do it at the time, but now you have to create a profile on the CIA.gov website. I think it's only good for about two weeks and then it disappears so that you're not just kind of sitting there, but you make a profile, you'll go through, they said, go through the jobs, the job descriptions on the website. They're very, very generic job descriptions. So You'll learn more like as the process goes along, if you make it to the next step in the process, then you'll find out, hey, more about what the job that you want to do entails, but it's very generic for a reason on the website. You pick the jobs you want and you start filling out the application. Application is very thorough. And part of that application is what's called an SF-86, which is life <laughs> in a nutshell. It's uh, secure. It's for your security um, background check. It's, uh, want to say it's about 40 pages 45 pages something like that but the last time i did it was with the job that i'm at now and it's been a little while so basically it's everything from you know where you're born and raised all the way up to today like your jobs that you've had people that you were you know friendly with because you're going to put down like not referrals but you're going to put down people who know you character witnesses people who can you know speak to who you are you're going to put down if you can remember them bosses that you've had you know, if you left the job, why did you leave? And they're going to check everything. They're going to check it all to make sure that number one, that you're telling the truth. And they're also going to want to see what kind of person did you mature into? You know, if you've had like seven jobs, they're going to want to know, were those jobs the same in the same area, which means just shows that you were focused in one area or were you spread out? Why did you leave those jobs? Those sorts of things. So my advice as far as that part of his concern is just tell everything, just put it all down with the exception of some pretty major, major criminal issues or financial issues. There's not much that's going to hurt you. You know, they're just going to ask questions, you know, Hey, we saw that you got a, a ticket for this. What happened? Can you explain it? You know, that sort of thing sometimes, and this didn't happen with me, but it's happened with other people that I've seen in my, this job, that job that I'm at now, people will put things down or in one spot and then it's different information. And so they have to explain that. So they'll send it back and say, Hey, can you, we found this discrepancy. Can you explain it or fix it? That sort of thing. The biggest thing is just be as accurate as possible. You know, talk to, you know, your parents, if they're still living, because one of the things they're going to ask you about is foreign contacts, you know, foreign relative, for relatives who are overseas or uh, foreign contacts. And, um, so it's okay that yep. you have those things. You just have to be forthcoming about it, that sort of thing. So, yeah. So once I had that all done and I moved on in the process, you know, your, your psyche evaluation, your physical, the physical is not anything necessarily to disqualify you. It's more to say, okay, we know that now that this guy has high blood pressure, so that needs to go in his record, that sort of thing. Um, because, <laughs> unlike in the movies, unless you are doing a certain division within the agency, doing special operations stuff, you're not required to pass a physical fitness test. 
you're not required to, hey, you have to be in the gym every day, or we have PT training at zero five, that sort of, you're on your own to stay in shape. So even at the training, you know, when you're at your training, like I said, unless you're with certain, a certain division in certain office there are certain offices, there is no physical standard. So yeah. So did all that. Like I said, it took, I think that would surprise a lot of people. uh, It does. And when I, whenever I talk to people, you know, they'll say, Hey, you know, this is my run time and I'll just look at them. And they're like, do I need to, you know, work on that? And I'm like, sure. If you're going to run the Boston Marathon, because the agency doesn't care. They don't, you know, as, yeah. and as I don't know, I can't speak to like FBI, because I know you have to go through the FBI Academy, at least all their, their special agents do. So there, there's a physical standard. I don't know about DIA. And I know that the service, um, service intelligence portions, obviously it's the military. So there's a standard. But as far as CIA is concerned, yeah. unless you are with a certain division, and certain offices, there is no physical standard at all. You are literally treated like an adult, so you're expected to act like one. And that includes your physical well-being and physical, your health, mental, otherwise. You know, they have things in place to help you with that, but they're not going to tell you, you know, you're up at five to run six miles, stuff like that. They don't, they used to back in the day in the 60s, 70s, and probably, I guess, the 80s. When you went through your field tradecraft training, you know, down at what they call, you know, in the movies, the farm, you did get up and you did do, you know, some sort of PT training. You did jump out of airplanes. You did firearms training and all that other stuff gone away. Unless you're going to certain units, like I said, or you're going to overseas, none of that stuff is a requirement. So, yeah. So once I finished, um, you know, the onboarding stuff, I started in March of 2008 and there's two different pipelines that you can go through. One is, uh, you can go straight to headquarters, you go to headquarters and you're there for up to three years trying to gain experience on the job training. Then they send you to your certification course or training. Then you'll go out into the field, you know, overseas, wherever it is you're going, or You can go to the pipeline that I went, which is you go to headquarters, you get orientation, you do a couple of months of on-the-job training at headquarters to learn how to write reports, things like that. Then you go immediately to your training. That's what I did. So did that. Once I was done with that, I had one or two follow-on schools and then went to my first assignment. And um, I worked domestically for my first assignment. Then I did some stuff in the Middle East and then came back. And finished out domestically. Interesting. I think when people think of the CIA, they, oh yeah, they don't work domestically. What, what, what do you say to that? We do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not just not the way it's shown in the movies. Yeah, we're not assassinating people, you know, on a you on U.S. soil or you know that sort of thing. It's it's hand in hand working with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies against targets that have a component to them. So let's just say there's someone here in the U.S. who the FBI is investigating or we have identified as a possible, let's say, terrorist or proliferator or whatever it is, we will work with the FBI to against that target. You know, we will provide the, hey, this is what's coming from overseas about this guy or girl. You know, they're building their criminal case you know, however they do it, we work hand in hand with them, you know, plus we also do outreach programs to us companies that might work overseas, things like that. Yeah. It's nothing like in the movies. After 9-11 and the, the report came out of, of, of the intelligence failures. And one of the things that was, that I think was interesting was the, the lack of collaboration. So that's, that has changed that. In your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I first got there, that was like a huge thing. That was a big thing is you will share with your partners. You know, you will, obviously, if they're cleared for it, they will get that information. There was, yeah, that was a huge, huge issue leading up to 9-11 and probably just after was a big thing was collaboration was not a priority. Matter of fact, it was frowned upon for anyone that's interested. There's a great series. I believe it's Hulu. I watched it on called the looming tower. 
It's a series about the events leading up to 9 11 and mm. lack of cooperation and collaboration. And uh, it's a really, really good one that'll give you a look inside it. You know, some of the things that probably that led to the events yeah, of really uh, good show. 9 11. So, yeah. So that was a big thing. Like we had literally had to sign something saying, you know, hey, we acknowledge, I want to say it's EO1233 or something like that. I think that's what it is. The memorandum of understanding or basically the memorandum that came down and said that we will cooperate that sort of thing. So, so I never had an issue, never had an issue with any of the IC partners. My personal opinion is I, I don't have a definitive answer, but my personal opinion is that because filmmakers, number one, it makes for good, mm. you know, good Hollywood, good picture, good film, whatever, uh, good book. But I, they're also taking, you, you know the saying, in every lie, there's a little bit of the truth. So they're taking things from the agency's past, you know, maybe helping overthrow a government that, you know, is not exactly lining up with the way we want. And things like that. Plus, there's the rumors, you know, about little things. The, the CIA bought crack into the African-American community in the uh, 80s and 90s. And all those things. All those things... I think Hollywood, they have something to draw on. So they use those things. And plus there's that mystery. There's that you don't know exactly. Nobody knows everything about the agency unless you've worked there. And even then you still don't know everything. So it's kind of that well, let's fill in the blanks. You know, let's take what we know and let's fill in the blanks. And it, I think it's easier to make us the bad guys. Yeah, fair enough. And I, yeah. I think, you know, me and you spoke about this before. and. One of the things that we at Great Dynamics right now are working on, particularly for analysts, is some talk, some type of a training, and hopefully you will be also on board on that as a as an instructor. And what I would like to ask you is, what is the, some advice that you could give for aspiring young people that want to join the IC? What are things that, from a young age on, they can look at, they can work on that would make their prospects? Better. So I would say two things. The first thing would be if you are a person who's of strong moral character, strong integrity, you know, that sort of thing, keep that no matter what, at all costs, keep that because that is going to be, I would say that would be in my experience, the thing that washed out probably 75% of the people who I know of who washed out, it was usually an integrity issue or a character issue. If that's the kind of person you are, maintain that at all costs, you know? And the other thing would be, be curious about the world that you live in. Don't bury your head in the sand because that's another thing that a recruiter, an uh, IC recruiter is going to look for is they're going to want to know, do you know what's going on in the world around you right now? The agency, when I applied, they asked, you know, hey, you know, can you tell us something that's going on? Right now, in one of my interviews, you know, what's what's a big thing in the news? And it didn't matter. I could have said something about sports. I, they just mm. want to know that you're keeping up with the world around you. They don't care about your political affiliations one way or the other, as long as those political affiliations, your political beliefs, your morals, things like that, don't skew how you do your job. As long as it's, you know, that sort of thing. You might not like whoever the, the president is at the time or whoever's in you know, Congress or the budget like that, you might not like them, but who cares? That's not, that is not, should not affect your job. So they're going to want to see those things. They're going to see that they want to see that you can be, um, morally, not morally ambiguous, but you can have your morals, you can have your strong morals and you should, you know, have those things. But as long as those things don't cloud your judgment and the way you do your job, and then as far as like your criminal background is concerned, if you don't have one, don't start one. If you do have one, <laughs> put it in your past and work to keep it there. Because again, there are many things on the list of what the, at least the agency considers that they will be able to work with. What they are, I can't say. I don't know exactly and probably wouldn't say because yeah. I don't want somebody saying, oh, okay, now I can go rob a bank and I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as long as it's not a repeated pattern and a history, because again, that speaks to your character, 
you should be able to be, you should be okay. And if you're associating, even if you're not, you don't partake in those things. If you hang out with people who do, they're going to find out. And that would be enough to, for them to say, no, thanks. Because again, that speaks to your character, you know? So I would say long story short, keep up with the world that you live in and be, be able to speak about what's going on. You know, give your opinion because that's a part of intelligence reporting is you report the point in that process, especially as an analyst, you're going to be asked to give your opinion on why you think such and such happened or this world leader said what they said. So be prepared to give your opinion as well as the facts and just keep your nose clean. And if this is what you want, then push for it. You know, yeah, the, let the agency or let the IC tell you thanks, but no thanks. Don't let anybody else dictate that for you. Ah, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go work for, you know, for the government. Our government's corrupt or such and such is an office right now. You don't want to go work for them right now because it's not about it's an office. It's about the agency that you work for and the job that you're doing. That's, that's it. Fair enough. And is there anything that you could say, I mean, I think the two, these two are very important as you stress them. Is there anything that you could like train yourself, maybe read or that, that you came across and say, Hey, that's a skill set or, or, or that's something that that is practical that you could practice for like, like languages, for example. Okay. So I'll start with that first. So languages, you do not run out and buy Rosetta stone and think that that's going to get you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a bonus if you do. And if. For, for certain jobs that, you know, they may require that you pick up a language, which they will train, they will give you that training once you're on board, if you can't get it before you on board. So, but if you're interested in language and you're, you know, far enough out, you're young enough that you can pick up that language before you apply, do it. I would encourage you to do it. When I was in college, I didn't speak any languages until I got to college. Then I studied some Egyptian Arabic and then living in Japan, I picked up some of it horribly in both cases, <laughs> but I still picked up some, but you can actually monetarily, you can, you can be awarded bonuses for speaking and writing and reading at a certain level. You'll yeah. test. And if you, depending on how high you score and maintain it, you could get a lot of money for, for, for that sort of thing. But the other thing I would say is one of my regrets coming on board to the agency was not reading more about the agency's history and their mission. So if you have an IC agency that you are interested in, read about them. You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Just read all about them as much as you can so you have a better understanding of what it is you're walking into, whose shoes you're about to fill, so to speak. I would say that if you're interested in a certain area of, let's just say, political science or you know, world affairs, whether that's China or Africa or counterproliferation or something like that. Read up on those things, study on those things. Just know that that may not be where you end up because mm -hmm. just like in the military, there's that saying the good, the needs of the service, you could on board with it in your head that you're going, Hey, I'm going to, you know, the China desk. That's where I'm going to sit East Asia division. I'm going to sit in the China desk. This is what I've been studying all my life. And they're going to be like, you speak German, right? Yeah, I do. Well, guess where you're going? You know, so you just don't know, <laughs> you know, they're yeah. going to try to use the skills that you have. If they're, you know, through the interviews, they're going to find out that, Hey, I studied a lot on China. I'm very interested in that. And they're going to try to steer you that way. But if at the time the need is for X and you studied Y, well, you might go to X first, work there for a little bit and then bounce back over to Y. You just have to be fluid. Ooh. Oh, and also, sorry, last thing would be your, uh, writing skills. Writing mm. skills are important. If you're not a very strong writer, work on it. And one yeah. of the things that a recruiter, I've always been a strong writer, which I think that's because of my parents. They were very big on that. But a recruiter, one of the uh, tips that they gave me for someone who's not is every day or every couple of days or a couple times a week or whatever, watch something on the news, look up something on the internet or read a newspaper and then take whatever that is and write, write it out. Like, Hey, this is what I looked at today. This is what I saw on the news today. Write out the facts, first of all, because that's the most important quote unquote part of an intelligence report. 
the facts, then underneath that or on a separate page, write your opinion on it. You know, oh, you know, I think that this world leader said this because of this, or these events happened because of this, in my opinion, because that's just as important as the facts. So, yeah, so definitely your writing skills. It's a whole nother world. These are not college papers you're writing. So the format that you're writing these reports in is, it was unlike anything I'd ever seen, but I was good at it. So helped. Yeah, that's an excellent piece of advice. I mean. Uh, I see this all the time with young people coming out of school. It doesn't matter. Top schools around the world. And the first thing they hit their head on is writing because they can write beautiful essays. But when it comes to writing reports, straightforward, mm -hmm. you know, don't mess yep. about, don't waffle around. Yeah, That's where everybody yep. struggles. And I mean everybody. It doesn't matter yeah. how smart you are. Mm -hmm. If you've never done it before, yeah, that's a huge one. And, and yep. I think also for us, something we pride ourselves on to focus Absolutely. on when we have new people or interns and with the training, same way to, to get that to a point that you're confident and, and people giving you an assignment can be confident in your writing. Yeah, that's it. And it's gotta be uniform. It's gotta be, everybody has to write the same way because the person that's going to end up reading this stuff and possibly using it to formulate policy or, you know, whatever, there can't be any room for variation. It's got to be the same because especially if it's going in the PDB, the president's daily briefing, they just peruse through that thing. So, and most of them don't read it themselves. I believe, I believe they're, you know, it's a, uh, a briefer who does it for them, but it's got to be succinct to the point. And these are the facts, you know, so that's how you need to learn Absolutely. how to write. So uh, yesterday you and, I, you and I talked about this, that you have a couple of years left. What are the, what are the plans after you leave the government? Yeah, I'm about five years from retirement. Once I'm done doing that, my wife and I's plan for, on a personal note is to buy the biggest RV because she's not a camper at all. So and she's giving me a dirty <laughs> look right now because, uh, she, you know, she wants one where she can do everything in it. You know, she could shower, whatever, you know, the only time she needs to, wants to go outside is to, I guess, look at the weather or something and then travel, just travel around. And then also because I'm retired from the Marine Corps, we can fly what's called space a space available. So we can go to just about any military base, uh, air base. And if they have flights going out and they have room on it, pay a small fee, hop on board, fly to wherever that plane is going. So that and then professionally, because I'll be retired, it's, I guess it technically wouldn't be professional, but I'd like to teach at some point, somewhere, some, you know, with a company like yours or something, I'd like to be an instructor, just pass on the things that were passed on to me. Awesome. I mean, yeah. Raise my grandchildren. I mean, you, you know, look very young, so I don't think people would assume you have children, but. Yeah, two of them. Beautiful babies. Amazing. I, I, I always ask this, not only in, in, in podcasts, but I ask this to everybody that I, that I speak to, what are you reading right now? What am I reading? So right now I am reading call sign chaos. It's the, it's a book about uh general James Mattis. I'm sure mm -hmm. most everybody is familiar with him. And it's really a book, uh, a book about him and his career. It's just as much, if not more a book on leadership and how to work on acquire those skills, you know, that sort of thing. I really just started it. So it's, mm -hmm. um, I'm just getting into it, but it's pretty good. You know, however you feel about him, he was, uh, from what I understand was a pretty good, uh, I never served under, but he was a pretty good, uh, leader. So someone gave it to me as a gift and I, I think said, most you know, what, I'm gonna give... yeah, yeah. So, I mean, give, you know, love it or, or love him or hate him. I, I'm the kind of person where whatever it is, book, whatever, I'll try to take the good out of it. You know, I'll try to, you know, even mm -hmm. if, you know, I don't like the person, if they're spewing some sort of knowledge, even if it's something I don't agree with, I can take it and say, okay, mm -hmm. that goes on my list of things that I definitely don't want to do. You know, if it's an experience they had, something I don't want to do, and I can still use that in my life. Um, so far, so good. Great. I mean, I mean, maybe you're not, but what are you watching? Is there anything you can recommend that you're watching right now? What am I watching? So my wife and I had started watching The Terminal List. It's uh, based on oh, a yes. Jack Carr novel. 
simultaneously without her, which she hates. I'm watching a series uh, <laughs> called The Old Man. Yeah. See, I just got another dirty look. He just gave this look of betrayal. <laughs> I started watching that, and it's a it's a, with Jeff Bridges. He plays a uh, long retired CIA officer who cut his teeth in uh, Afghanistan with the Mujahideen, and basically, it's his past is coming back to haunt him, and people want him dead, and so he's got to uh, stay on the run. And it's really, really good here in the U.S. It's on uh, FX. Yeah, it's really good. I'm going to check that out. I, I think I interrupted you. You wanted to add something. Oh, no, I was saying I was, it was a half joke because it's actually true. Plus any uh, Marvel or DC movie that comes out, I'm hopping right on that. So I'm a geek like that. You're in good company here. I'm looking forward to Black Adam. Yes. Rocks, uh, That's going to be good. DC yeah. version of Black Adam. I want to see how they, because he's always known as a quote unquote bad guy in the, mo in the comic books. Yeah. I guess for those who really don't know him very much, but he's like an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to see how they exactly. portrayed him. And honestly, I don't think they could have gotten anyone better to play him than The Rock. Maybe you could have played him, I'm sure. <laughs> Stop it. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> nowhere near that shape. So I wish, I don't think I would be able to maintain that in this lifetime or even the next. But thank you though. Jason, thank you so much for your time. Is there of anything course. you would like to add that we haven't touched upon or that you want to get off your chest, baby? Um, no, not really. I mean, for, for better or worse, actually worse, we, uh, are living in, I, I think I've said this phrase probably four or five times in the last couple of weeks. Um, since nine 11, we have witnessed, been witness to, or participated in historic and sometimes horrifying events that people before right. and maybe after us will never have never seen, or will never see. And what it's done to at least this country, um, and from what I can see of the world too, it just, it enrages me and it saddens me. And, but I don't think it has to be this way. So I think that if we can, if we narrow it down to, let's just say the IC to someone who's really interested in joining the IC, I think that if you look at it from a point of view of how can I come on board this agency to make a change? I think that will go miles. And when I say make a change, I don't necessarily mean socially. Those things will probably come from above us as they, as they have, whether they're forced or it's like, Hey, it's time that we, you know, you know, come into the modern age and do these things. Those things will take care of themselves. Those things will happen. And rightly so in most cases, rightly so. But I think if, as far as the person, the perspective, I see employee you know, someone who really wants to do this, if they can come on board with, you know, oh my God, I live in a time where anything is possible, good and bad. What am I going to do to influence those things for the good, you know, to make those changes? I think that'll go a long way. And if you keep that in your head every day, like every day that I was at the agency, again, I told you, I'm kind of like a geek like that. The one thing that got me out of bed in the morning was you know, I'm not going to curse, but holy crap, I get to go into this office or go to this meeting with this asset and talk about things or see things that the average person will never, ever even know took place or is taking place around them. And so I'm going to do it the best of my ability. And I worked with people and was mentored by people who are in books and, in you know, portrayed in movies. And I, and I won't talk about who they are, but some of the most amazing men and women I have ever had the pleasure of working with and for, and those things, because they helped change the world when they came up and they pass it on to me. So I feel like it's my job to pass it on to someone else. So if one of your listeners is really interested in this and they reach out to you, you're more than welcome to give them my email address and I will um, answer whatever questions I can. Amazing. I mean, I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for a better final answer. I mean, thank you so much again, Jason. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And I feel like I, I learned so much every time and I wish you Absolutely. all the best to you and all your family and in furthering your career and everything else. And for everybody listening, thank you guys for, for listening in. And I hope it was for you guys as illuminating as it was for me. 
and I will speak to you guys next week. Thank you.